Hello, hello. Back again for another episode of Six Rotations. I'm Daniel. He's Mick. And we've got a great episode for you. No big upsets this past weekend. So we get a little bit of a breather after back-to-back -back weeks where number one fell. As always, we're brought to you by SNA Sports. Better equipment for a better game. And Mick, there were a couple scares, and that's kind of where we are here in the season. We keep an eye on whether a big team might go down. Nebraska survived against 4,000-plus in Evanston, and we are going to have Big Ten Network and ESPN analyst Emily Eamon on with us in a little bit to talk about that match, along with the entire top 10 from the committee from two weeks ago. Now, we promised you guys we would give your our deep dives of that top 10, and now we've got a little bit more time to soak it in. A really important week coming up for teams like Rice and Western Kentucky. They will battle in a highly anticipated matchup on Thursday. How about Nebraska and Ohio State on Sunday? It's a great weekend. Where do you want to kind of start this one, Mick? Well, I don't know. You know, um, I, I guess uh, we ought to just look at the uh, matchups coming up this week. There are three or four that are important. Not a lot, but but when I say that, that not a lot, that just sets you up for the upsets, you know, because uh, the, there might not be the ones versus twos, but the ones versus fours, the ones versus fives, that's when you get caught uh, sitting there not thinking anything's going to happen. Well, let's take a look at the top 10 this week from the coaches. One through nine stay the same. And then, of course, Georgia Tech, who fell, they drop out of the top 10. San Diego still getting the love from the AVCA coaches. They have 19 straight wins, 11 straight sweeps. How about Pittsburgh? They've now beaten every single team in the ACC this season. They had a tough third set to win in four against Boston College on Saturday. Teams like Oregon looking strong. They swept Washington and beat Washington State in four. But Mick, let's start with a Wednesday matchup. Oregon, excuse me, Stanford, who leads the Pac-12 by two games over Oregon. They'll travel down to LA for a swing this week. First against the Trojans. They've got four losses, so not quite playing for the conference, but they could definitely cement their spot in the NCAA tournament with a win on Wednesday. That'll be on Pac-12 Network at 10 o'clock Eastern. And then Texas and Iowa State with a rematch on Wednesday. This time it's in Austin on Longhorn Network at 8 o'clock. Two good ones on Wednesday night. Yeah, and I'm I'm going to go to the uh, Texas-Iowa uh, State. I want to see if Iowa State's really for real there. But SC has got something to prove here. They have a chance to, to make a statement now on Wednesday at their place. They don't have to travel. They've got Stanford coming to them. Uh, we ought to see what's going to happen there. And obviously, can Iowa State do it again on the road in Gregory Gym? Uh, I don't know. Unfortunately, you know, the first time ranked in four years and the Cyclones were were upset last week. So they're out of the top 25, downed by Kansas State. You know, Stanford won their 11th straight match. I think I'm going to give them the nod. They are looking so strong right now. And then on Thursday, Purdue takes on Ohio State in West Lafayette. That could be an interesting one because the Boilermakers are looking like they might have righted the ship. They beat Michigan State in four. They beat Michigan as well in four on Sunday. Raven Colvin went historical on that match against Michigan State. Four set match record with a 700 attack percentage, 16 kills, no errors for Colvin, the middle blocker. Baylor, they won 20 games for the seventh straight season, did McGuire's Bears. And then what, what is going to be a fun one this week, Mick, and, and we could talk more on Thursday in a second, Rice Western Kentucky. It's been four years in a row that Western Kentucky has dominated Rice. They beat them in the Conference USA Finals in 21, in 20, in 19, in five sets. The last time Rice won, 2018 in the regular season when Southern Miss took home the Conference USA title. Do you give the nod to Rice? They are a little bit more battle-tested this season. Boy, Jenny Volpe wants to have this one. She she has had this group for quite a quite a good number of years, and she would like to to have a win here. Honestly, she's ranked higher than Western Kentucky right now, so she doesn't have to have it. Maybe that takes the pressure off, and they just play free, and they give Western Kentucky the best uh, match of their life. 
I, you know what? 21 versus 22. Certainly, of course, Rice had that big matchup with Baylor. They lost in three sets a few weeks ago. That was probably the last time they were truly tested. Western Kentucky, you've got to go all the way back to August when they were swept by Louisville. And that leads us right into Louisville. Because despite Georgia Tech's tough weekend, they've got a trance chance to get rid of that with short-term memory. They lost to Miami on Friday. They survived Florida State in five sets behind Julia Bergman's 38 kills on Sunday, Mick. That was wild. And Georgia Tech hosts Louisville Friday night, 7 o'clock, ACC Network Extra, Pitt and Syracuse at the same time on the same streaming service as well. Do you think Georgia Tech has a chance? And do you think Louisville's getting underrated by some of these coaches? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Two things. Uh, for Georgia Tech to win, Bergman has to bring all 38 of those kills back again. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, seriously, they 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 need to score points against Louisville. Uh, as for Louisville and San Diego uh, USD, that it seems like the coaches are not giving Louisville the love that the uh, RIP and... and yeah, they're uh, number two in the RPI right now is Louisville. Yeah. Yeah, and the and the uh, the NC two A committee gives them a lot of love, but the coaches they put them at five, and I find that interesting because that doesn't happen very often. That kind of uh, situation. Do we know what De Beers' situation is? Do, is she healthy? Do we know that? Not something that I have dug too deep in. You know, I'm not really in the in in the mood to break news here and now. So we're gonna wait and see on Friday. But let me show you again what the top 10 committee told us on October 29th. That was about a week and a half ago. It had Texas one, of course, Louisville two, Nebraska three, San Diego down to five, of course, Wisconsin at seven, and then the Stanford, Minnesota, Oregon. We expect Stanford to probably bump up a little bit, but at the end of the day. Is Louisville and Pittsburgh going to get regional sites? That's the question. Because Louisville, they did look a little shaky. They dropped the first set against North Carolina earlier this weekend. Then they ran through the second and third. But the fourth set was tight, too. They won it 25 to 23. And the Cardinal, of course, did have De Beer back, but only in a defensive and serving capacity, Mick. So she played four sets. She had 10 digs and a couple aces, but not one swing was taken. And of course, Chasse took 50 swings. They have uh, PK Kong who came in and took seven swings. So they're trying to go deep into their bench. Of course, the rematch will come in the L&N Federal Credit Union Arena in Louisville on November 18th. I'm not so sure they're both going to get top four seeds, you know, especially with the way that the Big Ten is moving. And we're talking Big Ten with Emily in a little bit. I think two Big Ten teams are going to get seeds over two ACC teams. Well, the RPI puts Stanford at third right now. And if 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 the committee listens to the RPI, Stanford could get one of those bids. In fact, we could get only one bid from each of the major conferences. Which we would be would be fair, right? You know, that would be it would be cool. It uh it would hurt attendance. Um from Depends. the standpoint of physical <laughs> attendance because of the number of seats available at a couple of those places. But uh, television attendance shouldn't hurt things at all. It should be it should be great for the game. Well, we hope Louisville will play in the Yum Center because, right, they just brought in 10,000 there a week and a half ago. Yeah. So yeah. And, if they do that, I'm not worried. She's okay. asked to get into there more often. Uh, that athletic director needs to support her in that program because they they'll bring them in. You know, she actually put out a plea on Twitter. I don't know if you saw this or not, asking the people they enjoyed the Georgia Tech match, but wanted them back the next day for a North Carolina match. She yeah. anticipated a close match. She was asking for the fans to to not take that one lightly and get back in their seats at one o'clock on Saturday, uh, and that That's did good. happen. So. Good call by Danny Busboom Kelly. Well, here's the situation with Stanford. Let me draw out this scenario. They are going to win the Pac-12 despite a utter collapse. They've got a two-game lead over Oregon. They've got to take on USC, UCLA this weekend. Then Stanford has a four-match home stretch to end the season. This is going to hurt their RPI, Nick. They play Arizona State, Arizona, Oregon State, Cal. That's going there's to not much them. to yeah. there's not much to gain there if you're if you're Ambly's crew. So yeah. I'm not sure that Stanford, unless they can get a collapse from 
you know, two of the three at the top of the Big Ten. And this is the fun part, right? The Big Ten right now, and of course, we've got some fun ones this weekend. Penn State at Purdue on Saturday. The big Nebraska-Ohio State battle on Sunday. Right now, Nebraska, Ohio State, and Wisconsin are all 13-1. and one. They're all going to play each other. And if they all beat each other, they would all have two losses to end the season. And that's where the, the Twitter users out there are loving the potential scenario for the three-way tie. Of course, there's the potential for the two-way tie in the ACC as well. If Louisville goes undefeated, Pitt loses just to Louisville. They both have one loss. What do you do with those five teams? Rochambeau for all of them. <laughs> what if you give none of them the top four, make them all go on the road, and you have it like, what, what do we think? Texas, Stanford, San Diego, and who could be our, our dream hypothetical uh, troll four seed? Throw it, you know, I guess it's not, you have to give it to someone there. So maybe throw it, throw it to the winner, the winner yeah. of, of the ACC. Yeah, well, that's right. The winner of the ACC, and I think I think Pitt has a good chance here, uh, you know, and and that's what no one's counting on right now. And they just keep sneaking along, sneaking along, getting better. So they they are war tested, you know. They've been in big matches the last three years, uh, matches with Penn State, matches with in the regional, matches. Uh, uh, going to the final four. So they're, they're ready to go with this group. Uh, they just not, uh, not out in front where everybody's seeing them right now. And so this is where the RPI sits. Stanford is three behind Louisville two, and then Nebraska, Ohio state pit, Wisconsin, Florida, San Diego, Kentucky rounds out the top 10. So you got those two SEC teams that we are not giving much love to at all because their competition has been low. But of course, Kentucky and Florida always play at the end of November. Minnesota you know, survived Illinois in five. Their number 11. Was that who you're going to mention? Yeah, no, I was just going to say this, that, that Kentucky has not beaten anybody. And yet they've taken care of business with everybody that's not been ranked. Yeah. And they come back in against Florida, who's been very quiet here getting their freshmen who freshmen and sophomore group who were playing really well for them uh, tested here. Uh, Kentucky could be a surprise. Uh, you know, uh, Craig is very good at bringing his teams along down there. Uh, he will have them ready to go. But this match with Florida is a big deal for these guys. And we'll talk more about that when the week comes. How about USC? They're 20th in RPI. So maybe I... You know, I said the win would definitely cement them. It feels like no matter what, as long as they take care of business, they'll be in the NCAA tournament. Then you've got interesting RPI numbers like Kansas and Arkansas, 24-25, both ahead of BYU, which is something to keep an eye on, certainly. Rice is 17 with Western Kentucky, 28. Northwestern is 29. They have to be feeling good. And, and of course, Emily, the Northwestern grad, will have her talk about it a little bit. But, Mick, I want to wrap up you and I chatting with a couple non-Power 5 headlines. Florida Gulf Coast, they win the A-Sun regular season for the second straight year. Wright State wins the Horizon League. They've got 19 straight victories moving into the potential end of this regular season. Towson and Hofstra have a huge weekend series this this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, to decide the Colonial Athletic Conference. Princeton and Yale are now tied because Princeton snapped Yale's 17-match winning streak, so they're both 11-1 in the Ivy League. And UTRGV is one win away from setting a program record. They're looking to take home the WAC title for this well, 2022 season. Princeton and Yale could mess things up for a lot of teams because if Princeton beats Yale, Yale's RPI is high enough that they're going to get in the tournament. Princeton did way. beat Yale, but you're no, saying no, they beat I them mean, again. Yeah, I mean again, and and if they finish, if they get the bid, if Princeton yeah. gets the bid, Yale's getting in, so that Yale's, takes somebody else's spot. Yale's 36 right now in the RPI, so we'll see where that it, kind of situation. As long as they're under 40, I think Daniel, they'll get they'll get in. I I think 40 is the magic number right now, depending upon how many upsets we have, because boy, those upsets could hurt people. And, and one you didn't mention, the Sun Belt, uh, James Madison is at 46 in the RPI, I believe, 47, 46, somewhere right there. But but they have five teams that can win that, that conference championship. So 
if things go the other way, they go as they're supposed to in every situation, we could get up to 43, 44, 45, 46. Those numbers could get teams in too. Yeah, Madison's so it, 44, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, okay. Yeah. And they're sitting 12 and 0 in the conference. And of course, Texas State 11 and 1. They're on a collision course. And now we'll be joined by Emily Eamon. Happy to be joined now by BTN and ESPN analyst Emily Eamon coming in to uh, enlighten us with your knowledge, Emily. And, and we've got a fun grouping here because we're in the beginning of November, but we're coming off of a weekend without any real upsets. The top nine for the AVCA stay the same. So it allows Mick and I to really open up just talking about the two week ago committee top 10 we didn't really get to hear any other opinions about it when it came out. So taking a look at it here with the Texas, Louisville, Nebraska top three, what are some of your opinions just instant here in the last couple of weeks about it? Well, for me, I think there's, I would say three main things or maybe qualms that I had with this top 10. I think for me, for San Diego, I, I completely, I understand maybe not having them in the top four based on, you know, strength of schedule is really the number one thing. But I think when you have a team like San Diego, a non-power five team that, you know, is really vying for a top four seed, they did everything in their power to try to make it happen. You know, they schedule the toughest non-conference matches that they possibly could. They win a lot of them, you know, their only loss, I believe, being to Louisville. I think this is a situation where if you have a non power five team that's doing everything they can to try to get a top four seed, you know, scheduling tough, getting those wins, then it just signals to these teams that, oh, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter if you schedule tough or get these wins, you know, you can't get a top four seed. And of course, you know, we have this conversation around Texas every year too, in terms of not playing a very tough conference schedule. When you look at San Diego, it's even um, more so that way playing in the conference that they're playing in. But for me, I I really would have liked to see them rewarded with the top four seed. And this also tells me that there's no chance that San Diego can get a top four seed now, considering the rest of their schedule, unless, you know, a, unless a team like Pitt or these top teams lose, which maybe could happen, but I, I don't see these top teams losing to anybody else except in the, another top team. So to me, that signals San Diego's already out of a top four seed, considering that was a conversation that they had and feels like that book to me is closed. Secondly, I think for Wisconsin, this felt a little bit low for them. I mean, especially, what was this, two weeks ago, coming off of a sweep against Nebraska and then a four-set win over Minnesota. It's like, what does this team need to do to try to get that top four seed? Again, I mean, they have a few other teams this season that they can play that potentially get wins against. They still have Penn state, Nebraska and Ohio state left, but right now for the Badgers, I mean, they have more ranked wins than anyone. They're eight and three against ranked teams. They also have two top 50 RPI wins, but I thought this felt a little low for them. Um, I would have probably had them higher in my top 10. Not that that means anything, but my other thing was, Oregon, I Oregon at 10, I know that they talked about that number 10 spot was really coveted and they went back and forth on so many teams. For me, I think I would have had Florida in there. I think Oregon is trending upwards. Um, I, of course, they've had that win against Stanford. But for me, what stands out for Florida is they have 10 top 50 RPI wins, you know, and in terms of the ranked versus non ranks, it's pretty even between, you know, the four or five teams that they're thinking about whether that's a, a Baylor, Florida, Oregon, Georgia Tech, maybe Kentucky in there. But I probably would have had Florida based on the teams that they're winning against that maybe aren't ranked teams, but are still those top 50 RPI teams. Well, what, what really stood out to us when we chatted in the last couple of weeks was that head-to-head -head clearly doesn't really matter to the committee this season yeah. because Pitt beats Louisville, and yet Louisville sits ahead of the Panthers. Nebraska, and you were on the call for that match, it was was not very close. It, you know, it, it got <laughs> kind of competitive in the second set, but it was pretty lopsided in favor of Wisconsin. And I think this poll came out before Wisconsin turned around and beat Minnesota. Oregon has beaten, you know, Stanford, and yet it's 8-10, and they, they now have beaten Washington and Washington State, which are quality wins. Do you think that head-to-head -head in the back end of the season will be valued more because Pitt will go to Louisville and Nebraska will host Wisconsin. And of course, those losses came on the road for both Louisville and Nebraska. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And, and one thing that they really do look at is those last 10 wins. And I think with so many of these massive games, you know, top 10 
matchups happening at literally the last possible second of the season on Friday and Saturday. I mean, just for the Big Ten, we have Nebraska playing um, Wisconsin on Friday and then Nebraska, Minnesota Saturday. We have Ohio State and Wisconsin also playing on that Saturday. You mentioned Pitt Louisville as well. I think the top 10 matters or top 10, meaning your last 10 wins. But also that last weekend, I think there's going to be a lot riding on that. And maybe if these matches were happening this upcoming weekend, maybe they wouldn't have as much pull. But I think just because those matches are happening literally at the end of the season, one night before the selection committee, you know, sends in their selections. I think that that's going to play a lot into um, how this shakes out, especially those head to heads. I think I would hope um, that maybe they would matter a little bit more than they did for this last committee reveal. And Nick, you've you've kind of mentioned that the committee has mirrored the RPI a little bit, and you see it most explicitly with Louisville. But then there's that that Florida conversation there at the bottom because the Gators are top ten in the RPI. San Diego is ranked a little bit higher than their RPI sits. So where do you feel like the metrics will will sit us in in a you know just about three weeks from now? Well, I mentioned one thing to you last week that I'll throw to him, uh, but concerning Wisconsin, they seem to be comfortable with the teams that they know, like the Big Ten teams. But if you look at their losses, they're uncomfortable with people outside of the Big Ten. At least they've shown that they've had some difficulty with those teams. So I, I'm not sure of... Um, and I don't know if this holds true for other Big Ten teams. Uh, in other words, they spend so much time focusing on each other that they get each other down to a science. But then there are these outside teams that they've maybe played early fall, uh, haven't played during the regular season, that are getting better. And San Diego's one. Uh, Louisville will be another one if De Beer is healthy. Uh, so, you know, how do you react to that? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of talk around Wisconsin and those early losses to Baylor and Florida. But when you look at those losses, I mean, they lost in five. And for Baylor, that was opening weekend. You know, I think that's why the selection committee really focuses on those last 10 games, because it's really hard to judge an opening weekend loss in Wisconsin case in five sets than maybe a loss to, you know, Nebraska in five sets in the last weekend of the season. I, I understand the logic in terms of, oh, they might have played these teams a little bit worse in the beginning but I think of course this is a Wisconsin team that we've seen get better throughout the season and this is a completely different team than we saw play Baylor um you know they're still trying to hash out the whole 6-2 thing I think a lot of these teams have been hashing it out all season long they finally look comfortable doing that but I think it's it maybe if they got swept by Baylor or swept by Florida, I think it would be a different conversation. Now, to be fair, like they almost did get swept by Florida. So I guess, you know, you could kind of throw that back at it, Florida being up 2-0 in that match and then eventually winning in five. But I think when you look at those early losses, them being five sets and them being so early on in the season, I think that's a reason why the committee weighs those last 10 games a little bit more just because teams are still figuring it out in those first few weeks, especially during non-conference play. I'm curious, Emily, and you know, someone that's, that's covering the Big Ten so exclusively and so tightly, you can kind of open our eyes, and obviously, you see the big N behind your left shoulder. So there's no, <laughs> there's no unbiasedness here. But Northwestern's sitting right there at that bubble. Do you see them as that last team in the Big Ten, or do you think someone else has a chance, maybe with a big finish to their season? I know Michigan's kind of hovered around our ABCA top 25, and they've, they've gotten votes, but they haven't necessarily turned it into success at the end of the year. Is it Northwestern as that final team, or is there someone else? Yeah, I think right now we're looking between Northwestern and Michigan. If you look at the standings right now, you also have Illinois and Indiana in there. Illinois is too far down in the RPI right now. They also are at a disadvantage because they don't play another ranked team um, for the rest of the year. So it's not like they can get one of those one really big win or maybe two big wins to push themselves in the tournament. The just missed it against Minnesota. Just, they just, just missed, missed it. Yeah. Just missed it. And the only good teams, I mean, you know, good teams that they have left are Michigan and Northwestern right now. And even if they take down those two teams, I don't see how they could get up enough to get into the tournament. So I'm probably ruling Illinois out for now. Indiana, they played a really easy first half of the Big Ten. So they play three more ranked teams and Northwestern and Illinois at the end of the season. So I'm probably putting the Hoosiers down there as well, even though in the standings, they look pretty good. So that leaves you with Northwestern and Michigan. And I think these are two teams that are really even right now. And in terms of playing 
their schedule for the rest of the season. Northwestern plays Michigan and they have Penn State and Illinois. And now Michigan has Purdue, Illinois, Northwestern. So for Michigan, it seems like potentially a it could be a bit easier. I mean, Penn State and Purdue are playing pretty similar right now, but they play the same kind of end of the season um, schedule for the most part. So I think it's really going to come down to how these teams do in the last few weeks of the season for Northwestern. Their starting setter has been out for a few weeks and their backup setter just went out with an injury last week. So they don't have anybody on their roster with, you know, the name setter next to them. So they potentially could have a DS setting for the next few weeks of the season. We'll see if Alexa Russo, their starting setter comes back you hope that she does so that it you know becomes a competitive end of the season for Michigan I think they're at a point where they're really vying for the tournament they've had it kind of in grasp all season they've been in and out of the top 25 um their RPI is sitting pretty good I would be surprised if Michigan didn't make it I I would see them probably getting a win oh probably Illinois but Illinois is playing a lot better um at this point in the season but those games against Purdue and Northwestern I think if Michigan takes down Purdue and really, even if they don't win against Northwestern, I think they're probably in with a win against Purdue. But anyway, I was going to say, Friday's anyway, big. North, Go ahead, Mick. Yeah, Northwestern's at 29 on the RPI and Michigan's yeah. at 40. There's no no way that uh, Northwestern's not going to get in. And the only way that they wouldn't get in is if the committee took into consideration injuries, which you're not supposed yeah. to do. So I, I think Michigan's on the outer border of not getting in. And I don't think Indiana and Illinois and those people even have a, a snowball's chance uh, yeah. of getting in there. Yeah, I, I think Illinois, no matter what happens, they're probably out of it, um, again, with sitting at RPI. But for Northwestern, again, they don't have a setter. So, you know, when you're playing the end of the season against Michigan, Penn State, Illinois, and they have two games against Michigan State, those aren't give me wins. You know, those bottom teams in the Big Ten, they can still get you. You look at a team like Iowa, I think they've won – like one game, but they're pushing these teams uh, really late. So it's those bottom of the teams in the Big Ten that I think Northwestern is probably really worried about right now in, in terms of, okay, we can lose maybe those games that we're, quote, supposed to lose or maybe those 50-50 games based on RPI. But if we lose any of these other games that are in the bottom of the Big Ten because we might not have a setter going into these last three weeks, that's probably going to be taken into consideration. And I don't know if those are automatic wins for them. Well, that's the question. Will it be taken? Will a loss on Friday, and then let's say you lose one to Michigan State, you know, they play twice against Michigan State, will it be factored that they don't have Rousseau? And can they rush her back in for that final stretch against Illinois? And you mentioned Penn State could be hungry because they're sitting in yeah. their minds probably right outside the top 16. Everyone, same with Purdue, right? Everyone's going to be bustling. And then the second concept, who's going to be that conference darling, right? We had Iowa State, West Virginia, all these teams from the Big 12 last season make the tournament. This year, it's looking like it could be the SEC with Georgia 35, LSU 38, Mississippi State 43. And if that happens, then you see a team like Michigan get the short end of the stick because of the Big 10 bias over the last decade. That feels like they're trying to correct something, at least last year. And then what we, Nick and I talked about a few moments ago on our one-on-one -on -one chat is it a conference like the Sun Belt, right? If James Madison yeah. doesn't win their tournament, or what was the other one we mentioned, Mick? Um, like UNLV, they're sitting at 20. Houston, obviously, at 18. Rice and, and Western Kentucky, you could pencil them both in. So that's when we're going to get, it's probably going to be the end of November when we can start to crunch and say, okay, how many of these 32 at-large bids are truly going to be at-large? And how many of them are left for five or six teams all chomping you don't have any update on Rousseau, do you? Because we it's it's one of those really important things because if they don't have her. Which I did. I know. Mick, have you seen something like a team at 29 drop off in the last few weeks? Because I feel like it's possible. I, I haven't I haven't seen a team at 29, but I've had I've seen a team at 36 drop off. I right now I'm looking at 40 as almost the magic number if everybody wins their tournament the way they're supposed to. Now that number could go down. Actually, if a lot of people get upset who have high RPIs in the 80s, 90s, 100s. Yale, right? We talked about yeah. Yale just lost Yale, to Princeton. Princeton situation. Yeah. That takes a spot. Uh, I mean, you start looking at those possibilities and, oh, my goodness, there's some people that don't want to be 40. They want yeah. to be 36, you know? And those conference tournaments, I mean, we always talk about them. If they shake out like they should, they never shake out like they should. You know, that's it's the chaos. It's what we want. It makes it fun. That's what makes Election Sunday fun. But 
No, I mean, we'll, we'll see, you know, you can never kind of predict the ends of seasons. And just when you think a team might be comfortable, then something big happens where, you know, another team has a really big win sending a question mark for a different team where they have an un a surprising loss. Um, I mean, it's, it's always chaotic, but it makes it fun. All right. The last thing I want to talk about here is throwing out the, the West coast conference because you, your first note was about San Diego and I I think five is a good spot, you know, in terms of just keeping it fair, because you can't really compare them to Nebraska and Texas and Louisville and Pittsburgh right now, but you can keep them hanging on because a travel finish at Pepperdine at BYU yeah. is going to help the RPI because BYU is 26, Pepperdine is 37. And the fact that San Diego has hovered in the top 10, despite playing against all these 200 plus RPI teams like Gonzaga and Pacific and, and San Francisco, there's another team hanging along, Mick, and, and I'll throw it to you. Do you think Pepperdine and LMU are going to get much consideration? Pepperdine's 37, yeah, I, LMU's 31. Could we see four bids from the yeah, West Coast? Yeah, I, I think you could, but Pepperdine's the one I think is in jeopardy, and they, they've they actually hurt uh, USD by not playing well here in the second half because USD might have captured a little bit higher RPI had Pepperdine played a little bit better and, and – uh, uh, LMU has been coming on. I mean, they've been challenging everybody. So I, I think there's a potential for four or a potential for LMU to leap gap Pepperdine and get in as number three. Uh, that's a possibility there. Yeah, Emily, when you when you were a player and there was, you know, end of the season and kind of like when, when you put yourself in, in the spot of some of these Michigan players or, you know, some of these other fringe spots, you kind of want San Diego to just run rampant through them and kind of bump up Pepperdine, though, will get a raise playing against San Diego, though. So it's kind of like a weird mix up here at the end of the year. Same thing is going to happen in the ACC and the SEC with Kentucky playing Florida. Everyone else's RPI is going to go up with those two playing. And, and it depends, of course, if they win, but I think it's also how they win. And you look at San Diego's schedule. I mean, they've swept everybody except, you know, the first two for really just Pepperdine and LMU during that first weekend of conference play. So it, it yes, it depends if they win these games, it, I don't want to say it's a given, but it feels like they will win. But can they sweep these last few opponents? I think that's even bigger consideration. And when you look at San Diego vying for that top four spot, if they sweep LMU, if they sweep Pepperdine and BYU, how can you possibly keep them out of the top four when they when they play their entire schedule like they should, winning those games like they should, dominating those games? But yeah, then you think of a Pepperdine who's on on the fringe, you know, if they push them to five, what does that mean for Pepperdine? You know, you look at these last 10 wins, especially the last weekend in terms of recency bias and how does that affect even getting into the tournament? And Pepperdine's so different than when I saw them and when Northwestern beat them in three sets. Yeah. And it's it's a shame though, because Pepperdine looks so strong beating Washington and then you lose Rachel Aarons and everything changes and, and there's, you know, no idea whether she'll come back for the end of the year or the postseason. But the last thing that I'll say is it's hard in my mind to put San Diego in the top four and leave Stanford out of it, you know, because it's just one of those things you look at it on paper and Stanford had such a tough non-conference and such a tough conference schedule because the Pac-12 has not been bad this year. And yeah. yet Stanford has looked so good. And what Mix talked about is you also have to factor in the attendance. You know, that's that's one of those politics things that the committee might talk about. Well, you put it in Madison or you put it in Columbus, you're going to get a little bit more bump nationally yeah. than if you have it in San Diego or in Palo Alto where the fans just don't quite care as much. Yeah. I think Stanford, we were talking about it this week, but Stanford is one of those teams that, you know, if they're kept out of the top four, which it's, you know, seems like they will be, that is a team you do not want to play when they are healthy, which they have been this entire season. They are so good. And the wins that they have under their belt, I mean, being five and four against ranked teams, but seven top 50 RPI wins along with that. I mean, that's more than anybody right now sitting in the top 10, um, at least in the ABCA poll, they're doing incredible things. And I think that's a team that's also peaking at the right time. Um, I, I, I think that team is incredible. And I, I don't know in terms of I don't, again, I don't think they'll get a top four seed, but I think you could make a case for them just with how well they're playing and peaking at the right time. We're in a spot, at least for now, that everyone in the top 13 feels like they are so strong. And yet we know come December 3rd, someone's going to fall. And, and I'm very excited to see what you're not going to be on the call on Sunday. So you can give us your full opinion, Nebraska, Ohio State, who do you give the edge to here? 
This is interesting because I think two, three weeks ago, I would have said Nebraska is probably going to crush them. Um, but now I think we've seen a Nebraska, I don't want to say team, but we've seen them play kind of how they haven't played before. They dominated the first few parts of um, conference play, but now they're at a point where I think teams are figuring out their holes. I think they figure if they can s- serve really, really tough, then that puts them in tough situations. Um, I mean, they have a few rotations with two passers that they kind of struggle in. And I, I think for them, if they can pass well, they win games just because of their offense can be really good when it's unpredictable, meaning it's in system. They can set anybody they want. For Ohio State, though, it comes down to how good their defense is going to be. We know they have one of the best offenses in the country. They have one of the best setters, a uh, few of the best hitters as well, and they are wildly unpredictable, very balanced offense. But the question is, can Ohio State block during this game? They are not an incredible ball blocking team defensively in the backcourt they do pretty well but I think if they can put up a solid block they'll be in a good spot so for them for Ohio State I think it's it's serving and blocking that's it's going to be a really big key for them and those are two things that they are this season haven't done an incredible job of but I think again Nebraska has showed a, a few holes in in their in their offense and in really their defense and serve receive that I think teams are now figuring out how to how to exploit a bit better than they did especially for the first half of conference play. That's the big matchup you know, this weekend. Go ahead, Nick. Uh, let me throw one thing that I was thinking about that I haven't heard in any discussion. You know, most of the teams across the country have gone fast. You know, that mm-hmm. San Diego offense with uh, Gabby's setting is, is just uh, really fast. Ohio State's running fast. Even Nebraska is running much faster than they have. But Stanford is running high. Mm -hmm. There's nothing fast about what they do. Um, What do you think that means? Is that give them an advantage, a disadvantage? What does that mean for Stanford? I, it's interesting for Stanford because again, yes, I think their hitters just do better hitting high balls. I think because they can jump so high that when they have space and time to see their shots open, see the block, whether it's well-formed or not, Typically with the higher offense, of course, you're seeing that block a bit better form because they have time to get there. But I think Stanford's hitters are just so talented that they do better with the high ball. And it really, I mean, it depends on the hitters, of course. I mean, I just coming off of watching uh, Northwestern, I mean, Temi Thomas, Ilara, she can really only hit high balls and it's incredible. But again, then you look at the other side of that with the quick offense, you normally have a lot more holes in the block. So you look at a team like, for example, I think Minnesota is running one of the fastest offenses in the country. And of course that depends on if you can be in system and run a quick offense, but when your team can be in system and can run quick, I think it has its advantages. Um, But then you look at a team like Nebraska, I think their, their offense has been a little bit different. They've changed it a bit. I mean, during the beginning, especially a big 10 play, they're running things pretty high. And I think part of that too, is being in a six, two offense. They're just from a consistency piece and you have, two setters coming in all the time. It just helped them be a little bit more consistent and have a a more consistent ball to their hitters. But I don't know. I I think when you have a team that isn't that great at blocking, take an Ohio state, they don't do well against a really quick offense just because it's harder for them to get there in time to close seams up. Um, And their backcourt defense has so many, you know, holes to try to fill at one time. Whereas I think they do a bit better playing a slower offense because they have time to actually close those holes. So I think in terms of at least Nebraska, Ohio state, if Nebraska's in system and running a quick offense, I think it's game over. Sunday. 4.30 4.30 Eastern time, Big Ten Network. <laughs> I seem to think that every time Nebraska is a bit of an underdog, they step up. And of course, they we felt like they were maybe the favorite in Madison, and that's when they've struggled. I, I've got I've got my uh I've got my edge on Big Red there. You can catch Emily though on Saturday, eight o'clock Eastern, Purdue hosting Penn State on BTN. So we will hear from you then. Thanks so much for joining us. He's Mick, she's Emily, I'm Daniel, and this is Six Rotations. 